All right, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your kindness and grace to us in Christ Jesus and the new world that is, well, for us, it is coming. For Jesus, it exists already. And we do pray that by studying your word, we may have a better insight into that world, which is our home, which is our true and everlasting home. And for it we live, for Christ we live, and we pray that as we look again into your word, we might be edified by it and our hope improved. We ask this through Christ. Amen. Okay, I'm taking a moment of personal privilege this morning because there was something in um, the Christian Post that I wanted to pass on. Someone wrote an article uh, entitled, Asking the Wrong Questions About Ravi Zacharias. And if you don't know, he was the famous, famous apologist who was engaged in all kinds of very strange and ongoing sexual activity, including investing in a massage parlor, if not more than one. This was long standing uh, with him, not some fall that happened spontaneously. And, you know, people are, well, what happened? What happened? It's, it's the cycle that happens every time a famous Christian has a great scandal. So in this article, to me, very predictable. The author writes, Closeness with God is our greatest defense against sin and temptation. So why are we leading with questions about organizational policies, yet silent over the single most important subject on this matter, one's daily life with God? Okay, so that's fine, and I actually agree that closeness with God is a great defense against sin and temptation. But a fellow wrote back in the comments, and his name is Clarice Q. And I'm not even sure I'm spelling it right. K, or pronouncing it rather, K-L-A-R-I-S Q-I-U. Clarice Q, or Q. Well, I, I knew a uh, student who had an L before the I-U, and it was Lou. Uh, he was from China. But his response is what I've been saying for 20 years, and I appreciated it. He comes at it from a slightly different angle, but if you listen to it, he writes, attention to personal devotions is good and right. We're all fine there. But this article displays a U.S. cultural bias that too quickly dismisses a vital cultural gift that God gives to us. Jesus gave us examples of individual devotion from his lifestyle. All right, so closeness with God, Daily life with God, no problem. But he also gave us an example of community life through how he trained and cared for his disciples. He had them practice ministry in groups. He showed them how important it was to serve each other. Middle Eastern culture is much more communal than U.S. individualism. We miss out on much that community can offer us when we fail to see how vital mutual care and interdependent living was for the early church. We are to care for each other as if we were all part of one body, 1 Corinthians 12. We are to equip each other, Ephesians 4. We are to love and serve one another, John 13. We are to encourage each other, Hebrews 10. 
When people's problems are diagnosed as only individual issues, parenthesis, not enough quiet time, Bible reading or prayer, that risks elevating religious, quote, work, and also risks letting Christian families slash communities off the hook if they fail in their Bible, biblical responsibilities to keep people accountable, help to heal, and bring to spiritual maturity. Psalm 78, Colossians 1, 28 and 29. You put him up to this, right, this guy? Oh, I, when I, I thought, finally someone. And the, the article that was written by Chuck Hetzler, Closeness with God, that was so predictable. Let's take a look at the man's daily quiet time. That's where the problem is. And that's where a problem may have been. But this guy, I mean, he's quoting plenty of scripture, including Ephesians 4, which I preached on here three separate times. And many, many times I've made the point that we voluntarily surrender, we have surrendered culturally, one of the most valuable gifts we have for sanctification, which is the biblical view of the Christian community. So it was nice to hear someone, not just read the Bible, but who's outside of our world looking in, and he says, wait a minute, you're just doing the same thing all over again. It's all about quiet time, quiet time, quiet time. And there, there are plenty of passages that support that, as he points out. But always at the expense of and really overlooking the church's unity as the body of Christ. So I really liked that. And I would have chimed in, except I have to sign up for privileges to write into Christian Post. I didn't want to. So I really, so nice to hear that from someone else. Now you have two witnesses. Mm -hmm. And culture. Do you know where he's from, didn't say? I think he had Canada, but his name suggests perhaps he's lived other places in the world too. All right. I just gave you a handout. And I should have sent it out, but I forgot even to send the Zoom link out, so. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, and I'm not even going to read all of it unless anyone wants to read all of it. But the title here is The Kingdom of God in the Gospel and Acts. Um, the first part is mostly, in fact, it might even exclusively be the gospel. Now, I do have Acts in here, too. <laughs> I just worked on this. You'd think I'd remember. Genius brains are cluttered, you know? Got it. Yeah. Um, I really have one point to make in all of this. And that is the ongoing point that when Jesus begins his ministry, he announces the kingdom of God. And the theme of his ministry throughout the Gospels remains the kingdom of God. Now, as it's often perceived in a more popular Christianity, Somewhere along the line, it begins kind of making this metamorphosis into a personal religion of salvation, which requires belief in the four spiritual laws. So that by the time we get to the other end of the Gospels or the Gospels and Acts, it's no longer about the kingdom of God. It's about personal religion with daily quiet times 
right? That was the man's point. Me and God alone, which is only really half the biblical story, but hardly the projection of the Gospels. So all the way up until the very end of the Gospels, and then after the resurrection in the book of Acts, the theme is still the kingdom of God. So where did it go? And that's the, the already not yet question that's dominating this Sunday school class. Where is the kingdom of God? If it sort of dies out in the ministry of Jesus because it evolves into a personal religion that includes Sunday morning attendance at a worship facility, then we would expect to find that in the Bible. We treat the Bible as authoritative, but that would seriously derail the biblical story as it's been presented to us up until now. Right? So, if you haven't asked the question, and I don't mean like in the last few weeks, but in your Christian experience, why not? It's as an important a question as um, who gets baptized and under what circumstances. Because everything is informed by that larger category of the kingdom of God. So down here, when we have conversations about all sorts of theological subjects, to one degree or another, they're answerable to the heading kingdom of God. This is what organizes the Christian religion. It's not your European heritage, so if you're German, you're a Lutheran. If you're Dutch, you're a Dutch Calvinist, right? If you're British, you're an Anglican. If you're Italian, you're a Catholic. Mm -mm. That has nothing to do with the Bible. It's kingdom of God, administered through a covenant. So, this is just a way of saying, look, all through the Gospels, everyone is talking about, in one way or another, the arrival of the kingdom of God. So, I'll just go through some of it. I always like this quote from Robert Stein. I read it 20 years ago. The heart of Jesus' teaching centers around the theme of the kingdom of God. Neither Jesus nor the evangelists ever defined exactly what they meant by this expression. They simply assumed that their hearers, readers would understand. Now how would, why could they make that assumption? I think Stein is right. They don't stop and explain it. Why could they make that assumption? Because it was on everybody's mind. Why? Because it was like what they had been waiting for for hundreds and hundreds of years. And why? Because of the prophets. Right. It's, it's what the Old Testament is all about, right? And so this is the natural sequel to the Old Testament. The Old Testament isn't about a religion of private salvation experiences. The Old Testament is about the kingdom of God. So, in you know, all those analogies I use where we read the New Testament, and it's like picking up book six in the Harry Potter series, Everyone in book six is talking about the arrival of Voldemort and you know, all the stuff that's going on. If you've never seen the movies or read the books. Same with the Gospels. We'll read the first five books in the series and you'll know what's going on when Jesus says, After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the Gospel of God, which is defined for us by Isaiah, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Believe in the gospel. So, he assumes 
that the hearers understand exactly what he's talking about. Now, we're just doing kind of statistical things here to make the point. The exact phrase, kingdom of God, occurs 14 times in Mark's gospel. And if you note the footnote, compare this to the number of times that the word, the verb justify, occurs. How many times does the word justify, as in justify by faith, occur in the Gospel of Mark? Zero. Zero. So, um, how did you know that? It was in your Oh, okay. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so, isn't that interesting? And this was what N.T. Wright said when I was paraphrasing him last week that we treat the story of Jesus as sort of the necessary prelude to Paul who really has something to say to us. As if the story of Jesus sort of exists as a setup for the real thing. Now that's a caricature, but sometimes caricatures help us to reflect a little bit on how we perceive ourselves in our faith. So justification by faith Stated that way does not appear in the Gospel of Mark at all, though, though salvation or healing by faith certainly does. Now, just to n uh, note the number of times kingdom of God appears, 14, doesn't indicate just how central the actual topic is. So when Bartimaeus cries out to Jesus, he calls him son of David. That's a kingdom of God category. When he enters Jerusalem, they say, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Pilate says to him, are you the king of the Jews? Now, for all intents and purposes, Mark 15 is the last chapter in Mark's gospel. There is a Mark 16, of course, but it's only about eight verses long. So, all the way up into the very end, the enemies of Jesus say, let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross. Mark 15, 39, when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. So, he didn't have insight into the Trinity when he said that. He is saying that this man was genuinely the king of Israel. Matthew uses the phrase kingdom of heaven, which is what we call a circumlocution. It's a way of referring to God by referring to something closely related to God. So he avoids, not always, but he avoids using the divine name in that title. Um, so he calls it the kingdom of heaven. He uses that phrase 32 times over and against the number of times he uses the word justify, which occurs only twice, and only one of the two concerns the judgment day acquittal. I tell you that on that day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Okay, so the 32 references to the kingdom of God, once again, don't do justice to the topic. The Canaanite woman, O Lord, son of David, kingdom of God. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, in the new world when the son of man will sit on his glorious throne. What's a throne? It's where the king sits. So if a king sits on a throne, what is he presiding over? The kingdom. Okay. Say to the daughter of Zion, Quoting the, referring back to Zechariah, Behold, your king is coming to you. Okay? Jeff, what was that reference for the justified in Matthew? 
12, 36, and 30. It's in the footnote. Okay. Now, in Luke Acts, the phrase kingdom of God occurs 38 times. 32 times in the Gospel of Luke. And six times in Acts. But again, the number goes higher when we consider the number of direct and indirect references. So from the start, when the angel speaks to Mary, he calls Jesus the Son of the Most High. That's the King. He will give to him the throne of his father David. That's the Davidic King. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Oh, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So, again, I'm, I'm caricaturing a little bit, but the angel should have said, Behold, the time for personal salvation has arrived. And the one who will die on a cross for the sins of the world is about to be born so that anyone who accepts him into his heart will be forgiven and can go to heaven. Why doesn't the angel say stuff like that? And why is that our gospel? I feel like I need to rush in and say, I believe all of that, right? That he died on the cross for our sins, that we have to trust him with faith, and that he takes our judgment, I believe in substitutionary atonement, in order that we can be with God forever, whether in the intermediate state after death, or more importantly, in the new creation after the resurrection. But why is that our gospel? when it gets so little attention in the Gospels. When did, it, when did it become that way? Hmm, I don't know. Much earlier on I suggested that it is, it is a Reader's Digest version of Christianity that is appropriate for mass evangelism. So it's a revivalistic approach to Christianity that makes good sense because common sense and utilitarianism are hallmarks of the American way of life. What works? What gets people saved? Right? And as the incident with D.L. Moody one of our four great evangelists in American history, sort of in the pantheon of evangelists, said his, his calling in life was because the world was a sinking ship that Moody was to fill the lifeboats. So his calling was to get people saved. That's actually not much of a calling in the, in the New Testament that I can think of. As I think about this, it's like an argument to be made that this goes back, at least, that this the emphasis goes back at least a thousand years in the history of the church. And just maybe through a series of things in church history, we're, where we're at today. You know, Bill, I think if someone did the work, they would support your point of view, that somewhere after the close of the canon, when Christianity meets Western, and to a degree Eastern philosophy, East, no, we, Eastern philosophy now means the Far East, I mean the Greek world, um, it, uh, it, ought to, it begins to undergo an evolution, so that the terminology we use the theological priorities that we create are driven partly by scripture, but partly by the language and culture of the, of the Gentile society in which the scriptures were being interpreted. Right? So if, if the Apostle Paul suddenly woke up in the year 1450 and surveyed medieval Christianity, what would he think? He'd probably use some naughty words, 
Like, what the, are you guys up to? What is this? Is this what I gave? Are you reading my book? And I suspect that if he woke up in 21st century America and visited a Christian bookstore, he might say the same thing. Or if he attended a revival rally or a Youth for Christ meeting or... And there's a, there's a very complicated effort here that really would require serious analysis. But if you were saved genuinely at a Youth for Christ meeting and your life was changed there and then you became a successful businessman, where would your affections be as you thought about your Christian life? The Youth for Christ meeting, and then you give money to Youth for Christ so that they continue this good work. And I'm not putting that down. All I'm saying is we've, by increments, we've left the sort of main road of biblical Christianity for a hundred different reasons, some obvious, some not so obvious, to create a Christianity that is virtually rival to the biblical form, which is what makes that letter to the editor so good, right? The guy who wrote the original article has a PhD from South Southeastern Seminary, or what, Southern Seminary, where they're giving out PhDs left and right, it seems. Um, and what does he write on? Personal devotions. Because that's, when I became a Christian and went into YWAM, that was the essence of Christianity. Personal devotions. And the guy says, well, wait a minute. Are you reading the Bible? Because, bet, 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 bet all say that the community has a, a, an essential role to play in our sanctification. Why are you isolating the private life with God at the expense of the community? That's because that's how we think. Jeff, do we know if he had any ecclesiastical connections? He wasn't... Not that I, oh yeah, he was Christian and Missionary Alliance. But he was too big to fail. Which has been one of your themes constantly, that these groups function outside the ordained means. Yes, and then they put their family members on the board. He's jet-setting all over the world, making videos and writing books. He's lying about his credentials. That was proven. They actually had to retract some of his books so that they could change the way that he, A, referred to himself. He did not have an earned doctorate. Yet he was calling himself Dr. Ravi Zacharias, right? And he did not have the educational CV that he claimed to have had. So he was inflating his credentials, which is a very worldly thing to do. It says, in order for me to have the broadest appeal, I need to lie about myself. Better guess mileage than did. Are we talking? I don't know if that's a question. Anyway, so I'm not here to pick on Rabbi Zacharias, but he is too big to fail, and we somehow need him for the gospel. No, we don't. We, we don't need a, a huge YouTube personality for apologetics. So, you know, YouTube is such a weird place. You go on, uh, Ravi destroys humanism. You know, and I click on it, and it's, it's the same old, same old argument. It didn't require falsified credentials to make the argument. It just required a very standard apologetical tradition in the Christian church. So, my, my big point here is, how can we read the Gospels and not realize that they are focused on a category inherited from the canonical Old Testament to provide continuity? The great category is kingdom of God. Individuals 
even in their salvation experiences, their, if you want, their private salvation experiences, what do they do? They enter the kingdom of God. Right? Um, so, Luke, indeed, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Uh, Luke 22, 28 through 30 is a particularly useful verse. Jesus speaking to his disciples, You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign, and really the word there in Greek is, I covenant to you a kingdom. I covenant to you, as my Father covenanted to me, a kingdom. He doesn't assign a kingdom. You don't assign kingdoms. The word there is a word used in the Old Testament. It's the verbal form of make a covenant. Even there, we kind of Gentilize the New Testament, even though it is talking about the kingdom of God. So, my Father covenanted to me a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes. Luke 22, 7, so they all said, are you the Son of God then? He said to them, you say that I am. Just the title, Son of God, I forgot to underline it. So any questions about that? We're just kind of flying through, just reinforcing the point that if we're going to read the Bible intelligently, we need to know that we're reading about God's kingdom when we read the Gospels. fuzzy on my dispensationalism, but it seems to me that they they're one of the main reasons for the departure from the main road in the kingdom of God because they either put it somewhere else, it doesn't have an immediate presence in reality. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, and their thinking I think are distinct. That might be. One of them is heavenly, one of them is earthly. Yeah. You don't ever hear them talk about it. Well, the kingdom, ironically, dispensationalism, which goes hand in glove with revivalism, at least in later American Christian history, takes very seriously the fact that Jesus and his ministry are all about the kingdom of God. But because they can't because they're so locked into the idea that it has to be a material, visible kingdom that arrived visibly and materially when Jesus came into the city, their only answer is, it must have been postponed. And so, the, the kingdom program, and I might be stereotyping a little bit here, it ground to a halt with the death of Jesus and was put on suspension for the duration of the time of the Gentiles. And then we'll pick up once more when Jesus returns and Israel... In other words, Israel had the final vote on whether the kingdom of God would be established. This is classic dispensationalism. It's not perhaps neo-dispensationalism. The nation of Israel had the final vote as to whether or not the kingdom of God would arrive. And they voted against it. And because they voted against it, God had no other choice except to postpone the arrival of his kingdom, and then he could switch over to the, the times of the Gentiles, which was, that might even be more of a heavenly orientation. And one day, and before, you know, the millennial reign on earth, and whether you're pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, one day, Jesus will return to Israel, and they'll recognize that they made a mistake when they voted no, and they'll vote yes, and the kingdom will be restored on earth with its temple and its Levitical priesthood. 
which if you think about it is interesting because in the city of God, as we've seen in Isaiah, for instance, you will all be priests. So there are all sorts of indications in the Old Testament itself that the old way of doing things provides sort of a form for what's coming, but it's certainly not going to be that form itself, right? So if everybody is a priest, or if there is an order according to Melchizedek, why is there a need for the restoration of a Levitical priesthood? I, I don't know how they answer that. I have been away from dispensationalism for a long time. So already the form is beginning to crack in the prophetic announcement of the new kingdom of God, and it's giving way to something that the old form, like old wineskins, can't contain, right? So the form has filled its purpose, but it's no longer necessary. The only p the part I'm arguing against on the classical reform side is that it's all fulfilled in the church without regard to the categories of kingdom, temple, priesthood, prophet, uh, city, and so forth. This is where the already not yet comes in. Okay. Okay, so Book of Acts, Kingdom of God six times, but two of those uses occur at the very start and at the very end of the book. And it is possible that Luke used Kingdom of God for bookends in order to communicate, literarily and perhaps subtly, that the kingdom was his book's main themes. So Jesus presented himself alive to them, his disciples, after suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And then at the end of the book, chapter 28, he lived there, that is, Paul lived there. He's in Rome now, two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him. And what is he doing? He's proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And what's interesting here is Paul continues to preach the kingdom of God, and this is important, as if the kingdom was a present reality, not a future coming event. While it is true that these words by themselves can be taken to mean the kingdom will come one day, the rest of his preaching indicates that the kingdom of God is a present reality that is still waiting a future revelation. Okay, then from the book of Acts, we do the same thing. References to Jesus on the throne, Jesus at God's right hand. Acts 9, he is the son of God. You are my son, today I have begotten you. The quote from Acts 2 in um, Acts chapter 13. Um, Acts 17, 2 through 3, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And I like to go back to the word order in the original. This is the Christ. That's a, that's a dramatic announcement. We have the Christ now. Jesus, whom I'm announcing or proclaiming to you. Acts 17, 6 through 7. Key text because it's a clash between kings, right? Jason, they're still acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And then finally in John's Gospel, not the same level of emphasis. Interestingly, the, the famous born-again passages are about the kingdom of God and not personal salvation per se. Uh, you can't see the kingdom of God nor enter it without undergoing a birth from above. When Nathaniel meets Jesus, he calls him the Son of God, the King of Israel. Perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself, the triumphal entry, and then, of course, the famous conversation with Pilate. 
that Pilate wants to know, are you a king? So Pilate wouldn't be interested in Jesus if Jesus was just a personal Lord and Savior. So that's all. We're now going to go now. This may seem a little redundant, but now we're going to do the nine again, only this time in the Gospel and Acts. But we have a moment for questions if you would like to ask any. I thought your footnote on the bottom of page three was interesting. That the kingdom of God only accrues one time in the Western Church. Yes. Yeah. I, you know, if you compare the story of redemption to the Westminster Standards, you will find that things that the Bible considers absolutely essential to the story are absent from the Westminster Confession, from the Standards. So we can't make too much of that because the Westminster Standards were written to define our dogma or our doctrine, to define it against heresy, to define it over and against rival Protestant religions, to define it over and against Roman Catholicism, and to bring some unity to the Reformed Church in Great Britain. So it's positive and negative, right? Just like statements of faith tend to be, polemical, and um, confessional. But it, it already indicates that in nascent Protestantism, well, 150 years old by this time, um, we talk about Christianity in a different way than how it's unfolding in the story of redemption. I like to see the two as complementary, but sometimes the strain between the two comes to the breaking point. I think you said, going back in reform theology, that, that the church just kind of replaces kingdom of God. Right. Would you expand on that? That could have been a universal thought at that time. I mean, would there have been other people in the reform thinking that when that was developed, would have had contrary views? Oh, if you read about Reformation history, everybody has a contrary view to everything. It's very interesting, especially if you read Reformation history by someone who has no dog in the fight. All kinds of things are springing up all over Europe related to Christianity, including a great revival of anti-Trinitarianism. So was that thought of the church is essentially what the kingdom of God means, was that really accepted? And if it just kind of, okay, that sounds good and you want to sum up? I think if you were, if, here's another interesting way. I can't really answer it because I don't have all the, the information at my fingertips. I would say that since Augustine, the general acknowledgement was that what the Old Testament described as the future kingdom of God exists now, quote, spiritually in the church. In fact, um, is it in this quotation? On page three. Yeah, the, um, under the heading of the church, in our standards, I think it's the kingdom, but church is our heading. Right? We don't have a heading kingdom of God. We have a heading church, which again is fine, but now the interest is in how do we organize and think about this thing called the church, which is very Pauline, but it sort of removes the emphasis on this unfolding story in redemptive history. My point a minute ago is going to be, if you read people like Calvin as they are writing commentary, they write good commentary on the biblical text. They're not goofy, right? It's a, it, but when it comes to formulating a theological position, 
these things are more expendable than other things in Christianity. So it gives us, it's like a translation, right? Something gets lost along the way. And now our, our great categories lack an organizing context that gives meaning to all the parts. Yeah, it's not like I'm the only reformed guy who's doing this. So that if that's at all reassuring to anybody, there are plenty of good reformed people who are saying what I'm saying. Some of them do it better. Some of them probably not as good. But um, yes, it's, it's really its own kind of renaissance in biblical studies that's been going on for about 40 years now. Some of the people that are talking about it, you are. I mean, are they ministers? Are they professors? Yes. Professors or both. both? Yeah. Well, let's bring your questions next week. We're out of time. Let's turn around now and get ready for worship.